Hi, my name is Dawn Poole and I'm the coordinator of the Educational Technology Program here at CSU Stanislaus. I'm going to talk with you a little bit today about the concept of technology integration and, and what it really means in classrooms. So I hope you enjoy. So if we think about what has happened with regard to technology in schools over the years, before computers were there, we had a model in which the teacher was at the front, maybe talking to students, maybe writing things on the blackboard. Students were generally sitting in individual desks. Maybe they were paying attention, maybe they weren't. Um, so that was kind of pre-1980s, even early 1980s. And then we started to get computers in the classroom, but not very many, so a lot of classrooms maybe had one computer at the back, and so the teacher didn't necessarily change anything that he or she was doing, still at the front of the classroom, talking with the chalkboard, maybe some kids were paying attention, but you can see a few back here that are looking at the student who's working on the computer, and the comment is, while one student played with the computer, the rest of the class wondered why they weren't. Well, now we are moving more toward a one-to-one -one student to computer ratio in a lot of our area schools. And what we really hope is that it doesn't look like this. Now, I know that the computers are not desktop devices, that they would be laptops or tablets instead of this. But what we want to avoid is having the teacher at the front of the class doing the same thing that he or she would have done without the computers, except for now the child has a computer along with it. So when we're talking about technology integration, what I really want you to think about is how technology can be used in meaningful ways to change what could happen in the classroom. So it's not the teacher who is delivering all the instruction, but rather that the computers are used for communication and collaboration and critical thinking and problem solving and things that are a little bit more difficult to accomplish without that technology. So we have a, a model of 21st century learning and within that model um, we can see that there's a lot of different things going on. The course subjects are part of this, the 21st century themes. We've got the four C's, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity along with life and career skills. And you can see that information, media, and technology skills is a part of that but it's definitely not the whole component. And it, it shouldn't be, it's, it's something that we need to think about using in a way in which we can actually reach the curriculum and help students to develop the four C's. So I also want to talk about a model called SAMR. And SAMR is an acronym for substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. So this is a model that a lot of schools are using with teachers to help them think about ways that technology could be used within curriculum. So there are two um, levels at the bottom that are considered to be enhancing what had been done without the computer and then redefinition and modification are the upper levels which are considered transformation which is basically accomplishing things using the technology that you wouldn't be able to do without it. So it's not as if the two lower levels are things we should avoid with technology, um, but what we're hoping is that teachers start moving more toward the modification and redefinition levels. So substitution is what happens when technology is used for something basically as a substitute for a non-technology based activity. For example, if you would normally in the past have given students a worksheet, but now you've created that worksheet as a form in Google Documents that students complete online, 
the teacher really hasn't changed the nature of activity of the activity it's just that students are now using the technology to make it happen so that's an example of substitution it's not inherently bad if we have the technology available then there's maybe not a good reason to have students do a paper and pencil worksheet anymore but that is a lower level kind of technology um, implementation augmentation is the next level up and that improves the previous paper and pencil kind of activity in some way. So it goes beyond just simple substituting where maybe embedded in the worksheet now is a hyperlink to a website but it still is a worksheet that students are completing. So there's an additional component to it that maybe couldn't be accomplished without the technology but there's not a whole lot added to the activity. Then when we get up to the transformation levels, the M in SAMR stands for modification, which is when technology is facilitating something that would be very difficult to accomplish without the technology. And I like this particular model because Bloom's taxonomy levels are also listed over here. And so when we're looking at modification, we're looking at the verbs applying analyzing and even evaluating to some degree. So modification would be having the students maybe work collaboratively on a document where they're giving feedback to each other um, and making modifications based on that feedback or equivalent kinds of things. I mean that's just one example. And then redefinition is really the creation level. So there are things that students would actually develop. Maybe it's a video, for example, that they would not be able to do without the technology. So what we really want to have you think about in this class, especially as you're working on the two assignments that involve um, looking at technology-based lessons and the application of media into a lesson, is, is really think about what you might be able to accomplish in terms of modification and redefinition. Now there's no teacher that I'm aware of that is able to to have only redefinition and modification technology uses in classrooms. There are always going to be times when some of the lower level uses are appropriate um, so I don't want to give you the impression that we should never have students complete a worksheet online, for example. Um, but we do want to move to more of the modification and redefinition based activities. Another model that is sometimes talked about with regard to technology integration is the TPAC model. And the TPAC stands for technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge. So if you look at the Venn diagram here, what it suggests is that a teacher comes into an educational setting understanding the content that's supposed to be taught to students. So you go in as the content expert. In addition, you have gone through or are going through a teacher preparation program that helps you understand good pedagogy and so you're also considered to be the pedagogical expert. You know how to design lessons in a way that reaches the learners you're trying to reach. But then there's also a technological knowledge which is knowing how to use technology resources. But the problem is that if you have only the content, or you have only the pedagogy, or you have only the technology, that you're not really able to effectively reach the learner. So ideally, the situation would merge technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge. So this little area within the Venn diagram would be the combination of all three. So the teacher knows the content, knows what needs to be done in order to reach the learners, and then determines how the technology might be able to be used in a way that can really benefit the learner, really augment the lesson, and so on. 
So technology shouldn't be used in isolation. It should be used as uh, an approach by a teacher to really accomplish the things that need to be accomplished. So just a few things to think about as you move on in class and um, hopefully into classrooms of your own at some point. In terms of integration, related to the TPAC model that I just showed you, everything that you're using the technology to do should relate to curriculum or standards. It shouldn't just be an add-on. It shouldn't just be used by kids when they're finished with some other assignment. It shouldn't just be used for games. So there, there has to be a reason for you to tap into those resources and that's what you really need to focus on. Also because the and I'm going to go back to this idea in a bit, but because it takes time, especially if you're working at the modification and redefinition SAMR levels, um, to engage students in the activities that would be ideal, it will give you a little bit more bang for the buck if you can think about how the activities can span multiple curricular areas. So that it's relatively easy to do that in an elementary classroom that's self-contained where you're the sole teacher of students so you can create these cross-curricular activities. If you're teaching in a junior high or a high school it's a little bit harder because you have to coordinate with a teacher in a different discipline. But if both of you or maybe three of you can work together on something that can combine um, maybe social studies and language arts and some kind of activity, then you might be able to justify the amount of time that students would engage in an activity that would really tap into some of those higher levels of the SAMR model. And an additional consideration is the concept of uh, differentiated instruction. So what we do know is that in any given class you're going to have students that are at all different reading levels, they're at all different maturity levels, they have different interests, um, some of them are very introverted or others are extroverted, some are good at writing, some are not as good at that activity. So one of the ways that we can really tap into technology is to think about how it can be used in a way that allows you to tap into the strengths of the individuals who are in your classroom. So that could involve the way you group students together in different projects. It could be giving them choices for projects that don't necessarily have to be the same for each individual um, and that would allow the students who perhaps are more advanced to be able to demonstrate their understanding in ways that are um, maybe a little more sophisticated than some of their peers. Another thing to think about is whether the technology-based activity that you engage students in should be a group activity or whether it should be an individual activity. There are a lot of things that you can do very effectively when students have the opportunity to work with others and really collaborate with each other. Um, so just because you're working in an environment with a one-to-one -one student to computer ratio doesn't mean that every activity needs to be an individual activity. On the flip side of that, if you are working with resources that uh, present the learner with material that is gauge toward their level, then those kinds of activities should be individual activities and in fact will be tracked based on student logins to those resources. So you really need to think about what is appropriate for an individual versus what is more appropriate for a group. In addition, what's really important and often overlooked is that all students need to have the opportunity to work with the technology. The digital um, equity gap is a reality. There are many students that you are teaching that don't necessarily have access to a computer at the home or they might have a computer but they don't have access to the internet. 
Um, most students do have some kind of access to a cell phone, a smartphone at home where they may be able to access resources that way, but it's a little different to access resources when you don't have a keyboard as opposed to um, doing it on a cell phone. So don't just give students the opportunity to work with the technology when they finish something else. You really need to build it in in a way that all students have those opportunities. Um, you might have to plan for students, certain students to have extra time in order to complete things, but, but really think about that equity issue. Um, if you don't have a computer for everybody, you might need to think about things like constructing centers um, and have a rotation schedule so that every student has an equal amount of time to work with the technology. And if you are doing group work, you might need to think about assigning students to different roles within the group so that there is individual accountability um, to, to ensure that one person doesn't just take over the entire project. And as I mentioned earlier, time is a consideration when you're using technology because technology-based projects, uh, just to be honest, are going to generally take longer than if you were doing something that was more teacher-centered. So there has to be planning time, there has to be collaboration time, there has to be time to go back and revise, there has to be time to create. I mean, all of those things um, might end up making a unit that you would normally teach in two weeks take three weeks. So you, you have some give and take. You have to decide what's most important to you and what the trade-offs are going to be. In terms of um, managing technology, it's a really good idea to do pre-computer activities like planning-based activities prior to having students access the technology. Um, there is always the uh, the possibility that students might get distracted with the technology, especially if they're on the web. And so having something that you've already pre-approved in place prior to giving them the okay to use the equipment helps to streamline and helps them keep on task a little bit better. You might use the idea of a task card or checklist, especially for elementary level students, that gives students some concrete goals and steps to be able to accomplish what they need to do. So um, it just provides a little bit more guidance than having nothing equivalent like that. Um, you can also think about having older students or more experienced students come in and serve as helpers as well. And another thing to think about is how long it takes to print things. Um, really we're kind of in an age now where not a lot of information should have to be printed. Students can copy and paste from various websites to be able to go back in uh, later on to review, um, but you want to decrease the reliance on printing everything out all of the time. Um, even submissions now via Google Classroom and Google Docs can be done electronically instead of paper and pencil form. So um, just think about ways to uh, tap into the digital nature of classroom-based activities to where you don't have to spend the extra time waiting for kids who are waiting for documents to print. And um, in terms of managing things, right now we do have Google Drive, which is used quite extensively in area schools. And if you have documents in Google Drive, you can deploy them to all of the students in your classroom. So there is no need then for a paper pencil version of worksheets, which is great. Um, it also allows you to keep track of when things get distributed and students can submit all of their things electronically to you. The nice thing about doing that through Google Drive is when you're distributing things electronically, your original material uh, doesn't get altered by what they have if you tell them that they need to save it in a certain format. Um, so they're sending it back to you as a, 
a differently named document. But even if you aren't using Google Drive, if you're just using a regular Word document, for example, if you click on Properties, you can choose Read Only. This is on the Windows side. On the Mac side, it's uh, Archive. And that will allow you to save that document as a template so that the user is forced to save as when they initially open it, and your original will always be the same. And then in terms of um, just making things work within a classroom, um, some kind of help signal like a bean bag or in classes I've used a plastic bag with beans or peas in it um, because that kind of molds to the monitor a little bit. Or I've also seen classrooms where they've used a dowel with a piece of uh, paper on the end of it and they have velcro on the back of the monitor and the velcro on the dowel and so a flag can be flipped up when students need help. It can get chaotic when you're using technology so if you just have a way for them to signal you where they don't have to hold their hand up in the air and they can still use the keyboard I think that'll make your classroom go a lot more smoothly. So there are two lessons that I'd like to talk briefly about. The media lesson is the first one. In this lesson, you are going to find a piece of web-based media. So it could be text, audio, an image, or a video. And you will then select that resource so that students can demonstrate their ability to really understand the content and site-specific evidence in response to questions you ask about that particular resource. So after you locate the resource, um, and it does, that resource does need to relate to a standard or objective, so you will include that in your submission. You'll have a hyperlink to the actual um, resource. And then you're going to write three questions that students could answer from that resource. So two of the questions, have to require them to cite specific evidence from the resource that you've selected. So you need to select your resource very carefully. And then you're also going to submit potential answers that students could submit in response to the questions that you ask. So that's the media-based lesson. Um, it kind of aligns with the Smarter Balanced Assessment testing where students are asked to cite evidence um, in the passages they read, in the podcasts they listen to, in the videos they see on the test itself. So this kind of gives some practice with that. So I have it in the, um, the technology integration piece in that there's all kinds of resources out there right now. And one of the things that we have to do as teachers is give students very concrete opportunities to demonstrate their understanding of that content and that's what this assignment is designed to do. In addition to the media lesson there's also a technology-based lesson that you will complete. In this activity you will actually develop a lesson plan so that will be one in which you have your students using technology um, ideally at the modification or redirection um, levels of the SAMR model. So we're looking not just at the substitution stage, ideally. So the lesson that you complete needs to be, or that you submit, needs to be developed for a specific group of students. So you'll specify the grade level and the standards or objectives that you're trying to reach. Um, think about approximately how much time you would need for the lesson. Are there materials that are needed? And then you're actually going to write up the lesson plan as if your instructor were going to teach the class for you. So there needs to be enough detail there so if that person were subbing, he or she could actually carry out the lesson. Um, incorporate adaptations that could be made for English language learners include a description of why you believe the lesson plan is an example of one in which technology is integrated well. You know, why do you think technology is integrated well? And then an explanation of which of the SAMR levels you believe the question 
or the lesson addresses. So that's the other main activity in the class that relates to technology integration into the classroom where you are doing more on your own. Like we're not telling you what resource needs to be used as we have in several of the other assignments. There's a lot to think about in terms of integrating technology into curriculum and hopefully this presentation has given you a few additional things to think about along with what you've learned in the class already. Best wishes!